Hi. So I visited Universal Studios Hollywood uh, recently, and I discovered that the studios were founded right before World War I and opened during World War I by a German immigrant. <laughs> so even something that appears perfectly innocuous and divorced from the military industrial complex in the United States probably got its start manufacturing anti-German propaganda. You get the German immigrant here, you can create a fake, well, any kind of fake video, any sort of fake backdrop, and then you distribute that to create emotional support for your side. And to the extent that you are, in fact, on the right side of a war or a cause, it seems like that sort of propaganda would be an acceptable form of, I suppose, support. The problem is when it seeps through every segment of your society to the point where humanity's storytelling function overwhelms facts and logic, thereby inviting the truth to destroy the entire foundation. So, I visited that. I went over to Universal, after Universal Studios Hollywood. I then went over to an art museum and the art museum had a large painting of the former president, Barack Obama, along with his wife next door, next to, no, right next to it. And it dawned on me that I was looking at more propaganda. And I say that because the description under the portrait was African-American. The word African-American was used to describe former President Barack Obama. The problem is it's, it's, not, it's not accurate. The reason African-Americans are called African-Americans is because for the most part, Actually, I shouldn't even say for the most part, because they don't know the country from where their ancestors came from. So Barack Obama does know where he comes from because his mother dated an African, not an African-American. So he knows that he comes from, I believe, Kenya. So the appropriate term to describe him would be Kenyan-American, just like a German would describe himself not as a European-American, but as a German-American or an Italian-American and so on and so forth. And so I went from one studio to another studio in a sense. And these are both in a, supposed to be somewhat educational. You know, you go to a studio not because you only want to be entertained, but because you want to learn something about how movies are made, you want to learn about how things work. And being in Los Angeles, which is one of the centers for Western media, it dawns on you that they've done too good of a job. And in doing so, have placed the truth so far out of reach that it threatens the foundation of Western civilization. So of course, the reason that you don't call President Obama a Kenyan American because you want him to identify with the majority of people and voters in this country who are African-American. And if you decide to go a step further and explain all of that, why he was called a community organizer rather than a lawyer while campaigning, if you try to explain all these things, it becomes harder to create an image of success. And it also becomes harder to maintain the Christian storytelling function. Because it's quite possible that we're looking at a storytelling function which is fictional, in a sense, overwhelming facts and logic. And so we wake up to a country where a president is using a term, language, as a form of propaganda. And no one blinks an eye because they've gotten so used to it. And it's very convenient because if you do actually end up calling President Obama a Kenyan American with a mother who is a Protestant American from Kansas, you start to parse things so finely 
that you become incapable of appealing to a broad demographic. And that goes back to what politicians are supposed to do. Are they supposed to appeal to a broad demographic or are they supposed to come up with principles that we can all agree on, thereby binding us together, not only because of a, being appealing to as many groups as possible, but because they're able to come up with principles that, that they can then convince the other branches of government, the lawyers, the judges, the police, and the military, and of course, the lawmakers to follow. In other words, what, is it, what does it mean to be a leader? And you can see how you need both. But for purposes of this lecture or discussion, it's important to realize that even when evaluating the most basic language, the most basic methods of communication, the political branch, almost all of them, completely failed. Because even at the very top, they were unwilling to admit an uncomfortable truth. And because of that, much of the media, whether from LA or, or another place, is manufactured in order to bind people together in good faith, but in a way that obscures the truth, thereby making it extremely vulnerable to outside influence, which then, of course, leads to censorship. If whatever philosophy you have is appealing and convincing, but lacks a foundation of truth, censorship is, is inevitable. And that's why so many people, everybody from Martin Luther King to myself, over time include progressives and liberals as part of the group deserving blame for a country's collapse. Because if you are in a position where you have to sit down and explain that the reason it's dishonest, in a sense, or misleading to call President Obama, an African-American, you have to then get into really uncomfortable truths. One of which might be that the Protestants and the Catholics in this country were able to set aside their religious differences only because they were able to import Muslim labor into this country by force and by deception, otherwise known as chattel slavery. If you want to get even more into it and get closer to the truth, it's probably also misleading to call both Catholics and Protestants Christians. In fact, the Protestants split from the Catholic Church. That's what the Protestant Reformation was. It was a protest of the corruption in the Catholic Church. Protestant Protestants. So how far, how deep down the rabbit hole do you want to go? As the movie The Matrix, Matrix asks. And you can see how there are two paths, or at least at least two paths. One of them is what Canada is doing. They're simply realizing that they can't, they're too small in population to fight the truth. So they're letting it seep out, resolving claims using litigation in a sense, as well as documentaries designed to educate. And then paying survivors of corruption, whether Catholic or otherwise in the school system, and then the forced separation of indigenous people, children from their parents in order to civilize them through a civilization that again, seems to be, seems to be built on a foundation of lies, or at least optimistic storytelling. And then you simply, if you're a Canadian, apologize and move on. You've try to, to achieve what the legal system attempts to do, which is to provide transparency into the facts in a way that is more logical than emotional. And you try to make the victims whole in order to achieve closure and you move on. Canada is small enough population-wise with enough immigrants to make this approach viable. But in America, which is vast, with diverse populations spread out, many of whom lack political power simply because of gerrymandering and other political tricks. The question is, how does this country move forward?
if it is to confront its own history. And I don't know the answer to that. That's one of the reasons why I predict I'm going to eventually, like James Baldwin, uh, leave the country and try to go someplace else which has a more honest approach towards education and politics. But I want you to, you to understand something. If everything you see is propaganda within a country that's built on debt and chattel slavery, corruption is guaranteed, as is a reaction to that corruption. And that means that all of this prosperity is, in a sense, built on sand, even though it doesn't feel that way because the propaganda is so good when you watch a movie that comes out of Hollywood. It's amazing. It makes you feel good. You walk out of, we walk out of that theater with a good feeling and optimism. There ought to be a balance. You can have both. Within every tragedy, there is always a hero. You can focus on the heroes while admitting the tragedy. But in this country, where the African-American population is still poor, on average, compared to the other segments of the population, it's hard to admit the, tr admit the truth until that group as a whole, or until all the groups in America that are now gerrymandered politically and are for the most part segregated based on race or religion, sometimes both, it's hard to admit the truth in a time when the truth may destabilize social relations. So you can see why there has to be some dishonesty involved when educating people. If every African-American looked next to him or her and saw someone who is in that position, not because of merit, but something else, but because of, of abuse of his ancestors, social relations wouldn't really be optimal. If a Christian or a Baptist, Southern Baptist, realized that the Bible does not expressly outlaw slavery, which may have made it easier for both the Protestants and the Catholics to collude in order to maintain an immoral institution, it makes it harder for them to assimilate within a society that is for sure Christian and Catholic, or Protestant and Catholic, I should say. So we are now experiencing what I believe to be a gap, a, an interim period between the optimistic projections of our media and of our studios in America and reality. And the reason we're looking at so much dissension, so much social instability in the United States as well as overseas is because we haven't yet fought the ghosts of World War II, which segregated populations out of a sincere belief that segregation based on race or religion would minimize conflicts. And what it's actually done is that it's made it easier for people to lie about themselves and their own history. And if you do that, you have to catch up to the lie. You have to make the lie into reality. And if you don't do that, the truth will destroy you. That's what's happening in this country right now. This was happening across the board. It's happening because this country in the 1960s attempted to find the truth, attempted to reverse the military industrial complex and failed. Remember, the Hollywood studio in a liberal progressive city got its start through military propaganda. It's in every segment, in every facet of American life, because World War II wasn't really that long ago. It just seems that way because there's been so many other wars that happened after World War II as a result of World War II not resolving border conflicts. So Vietnam, again, you have what globalization is, what is it? 
its corporate interests, backed by sovereign militaries going around the world in order to project not only propaganda, but services and infrastructure. In order to, not necessarily to exploit labor, but in order to get a reasonable return on investment while also creating a type of homogenous culture that is supposed to get us all on the same page. In other words, if we all speak the same language, chances of mistranslation and therefore misunderstanding ought to be minimized. <laughs> that's not, you can see how that, that's not necessarily, that's not true. The United States, since the year 2001, has proven that's not true for the last 20 years. But rather than try to circle back and resolve these conflicts, it's seeded because it can maintain that studio type propaganda. Rather than circle back like the Canadians and try to achieve a balance between optimism and reality and rehabilitation of the past, it, it's gone the other way. It's, it's decided that its propaganda is so good that it doesn't need to rehabilitate the past. If, you, if enough people believe in a lie, it becomes a truth, in a sense, for a while. But this is happening at the same time that formerly colonized countries, like China, uh, countries that have built themselves back up, like Russia, they're realizing that this country is built on a lie. And because they've been colonized or pushed into collapse, they're able to, within a, technolo a, a, within a technologically, I suppose, level playing field, attack uh, the ideological foundations of the United States. That's what you're looking at now. Now, when you look at social, when you look at political confusion, I mean, when you look at the studios using distractions, sometimes in the form of politicians themselves in order to take attention away from the hard work of building understanding until a point in time when that gap that I mentioned narrows. But again, this is happening at the same time that competitors are rising and have been rising for the last 20 years, at least or at least the last 30 years. So you have all this, you have all this unresolved conflict post-World War II that leads to multiple wars all over the world. None of which is taught in this country, by the way. If you look up the Bandung in Indonesia conference, no one teaches that here. Uh, I mean, you have to read Malcolm X though to figure it out. Um, you can get there, it's just difficult. You look at that, you look at you know, the Dutch in Indonesia, you look at the Vietnam War, you look at just everything. The invasion of Tibet by China to secure water resources. You look at Hong Kong, you look at Macau. Everywhere you look, there's been an attempt by the military, uh, by military alliances, to secure ports for their services and goods in order to replace governments all over the world, which have been weak post-World War II, to the extent that they, they were either not on the right side or were not involved because they were not able to build up their manufacturing systems as quickly. But you have to remember, even the victors of World War II were in massive debt. <laughs> the British owed money after World War II to the Americans. And so as I walk through these streets in America, I'm looking at the end of American influence, ideologically, but not, but not with respect to all the things that these military alliances have provided, which is goods, products and services, cars. You know, I'm looking at a Japanese car now. Well, that's, I think it's called Kaizen or the Toyota manufacturing process. Um, you know, all these things were implemented in order for these countries to build their systems back up after losing a war. So, so that they could join a, not just a military alliance all over the world, but also one that's based on trade 
which would then facilitate understanding. You might want to look at it this way. Military goes in, wins the war, but has no experience in building up community relations. Or so what it does is it secures the premises and then allows the professors to come in and the helpers, the doctors, the teachers to come in and then create something that isn't propaganda, something that is genuinely helpful. And if you have traveled the world like I have, you'll notice that much of most of the world is completely undeveloped. It's just sitting there waiting to be developed. The question is, how is it going to be developed and by whom? And who is going to provide the protection in order for it to develop? In other words, in order for stability to exist so that investors and banking banks come in and feel comfortable assisting in development. So far, despite good intentions, even that aspect of develop development hasn't worked. If you go into the Philippines, the outside of a few cities, you know, the lack of city planning, long-term planning has resulted in, I guess I would describe it as development chaos. Manila is a mess, pollution and so on. Why? Because it not only invited the Americans to invest and invited all, a, lot, a lot of other countries to invest to do what's called FDI, and that resulted in haphazard development, in a sense, a race to the bottom as the banks and as investors demanded terms that help, that help themselves and their investors in the short term, but not everyone in the long term. It, it's everywhere, Middle East. Um, even when you have good intentions, you can still fail. So you look at that, you look at what appears to be this, uh, this phenomenon of the bankers realizing that countries soaked in debt, whether after World War II or World War I or otherwise, are going to have an elite that will eventually be looked down upon. And so what a lot of countries did in so-called developed, banks that in so-called developed countries, they co-opted the governments. They said, well, you know what? We'll give you terms and conditions that favor you and give you job protections so that you'll feel stable and that you won't be too demanding on us, the banking system. And so what ended up happening was in the, in the, in the past, you had this idea of rentiers, so of people exacting rents but not necessarily improving infrastructure or the community. So what really happened was another phenomenon post-World War II was the banks made every, the governments, or at least some of them, into rentiers or rentiers. I'm mispronouncing the French. And the governments became ineffective and therefore unable to regulate properly the banking system, which then led to an explosion of debt. We're looking at it now with SPACs, S-P-A-C, uh, it's just this unregulated, in a sense, swath of money coming into the country, providing jobs, but not necessarily in a way that makes the whole country better. China has figured this out <laughs> and is trying to regulate in a way that preserves governmental integrity. But the United States isn't there yet. It's not there yet because of propaganda. It's not there yet because the studios are just too good. And it's not there yet because the teachers have failed. Because once again, if the banks co-opt the government, the teachers are government employees in the public system, they're going to teach <laughs> in a way that preserves whatever funding mechanism is, has been put in place that preserves their jobs. That of course corrupts the lawyers and the legal system. And then eventually you're just left with disdain for government, which allows the executive branch the police and the military to rise, the intelligence agencies to rise and take extrajudicial measures to ensure not just efficiency, but productivity. That's what's happening now, all over the world. People are realizing all the age old truths that debt corrupts The world that has been built on a military-industrial complex 
and never look back. When that happens, and this, by the way, applies everywhere. Singapore, a country that was admitted to, to the United Nations, uh, when it was admitted, it gave a speech where it said, its representative said, I think it was Raja Ratnam, it said, we seek to be a welfare state, not a warfare state. Something along those lines. The word welfare was meant as social welfare, making everyone's lot better. Today, the largest item in Singapore's budget is military spend spending. Even countries that have been wildly successful, like Singapore, that have stable and honest police officers, that have probably the most stable political system in the whole world, even they have not managed to escape Eisenhower's warning about the military-industrial complex. So you look around, and if everything seems unstable, it's because everything is, in a sense, built on debt and propaganda, and therefore fake. And in a sense, I'm lucky to be part of this gap, to be living in, a, in an empire during this gap between propaganda and reality, because I get to tell the story. Once this gap is resolved, History will still matter, but it won't be easily ascertainable because the problem with speedy development that doesn't also consider the truth is that cultures get lost along the way. And it's already difficult to reach back and connect hands with your ancestors somewhere in the world 200 years ago, much less a thousand years ago. At some point, that ability to reach back and connect the chain of humanity together in a way that does allow politicians and leaders to create principles to bind us together based on the truth. At some point, that's going to be lost. The task moving forward is to evaluate why we have politicians and to evaluate why governments and banks should not be in positions to create unholy alliances. And what we have here, the reason I'm worried is because this typically precipitates war of some sort, is a loss of principles, at least publicly, at least on mainstream media channels. And this appears to be intentional if the banking system and its cronies in the media are allowed to cause disrespect for the, all the political branches, they get their own way. The government cannot muster enough power in order to regulate the banking system, which then results in, a, in the status quo. We know that's, that's happened in 2008 and 2009 uh, when we had that financial crisis all over the world. We had that. We had the, the savings and loan savings and loan crisis before then. Well, today there's more debt than private and public, I believe, today than in 2008, 2009. So we haven't escaped the paradigm. We've just, I suppose, learned to love the banks. And this is somewhat ironic for me to be saying this because I believe that one of America's greatest strengths, another effect of World War II, is its banking prowess. If you travel the world, you'll know that it's not everywhere, not everywhere has an ATM or a money exchange. It's not easy to convert currency all the time. Um, it's not just an American in Cuba. You know, some countries still have dual currency systems like Cuba. You gain an appreciation of the banking sector's prowess just by traveling enough. But with every positive, there's a negative. And the, we're looking at, at this point, more negatives only because the banking system, by becoming so much more effective than the political system, has effectively created 
a lack of checks and balances. This is happening at the same time that the private sector is has been attempting to replace the government in every possible way. Uh, there are now more private security companies oh, than ever before. Not just physically, like security guards, but online in cybersecurity. Every, every year, multiple cybersecurity companies pop up. You get the sense that we're going to have difficulty reversing segregation if the walls around us simply move from physical to digital. But it's going to be even more difficult because without physical walls to look at, if those walls are digital, we may not even know there's a problem until it's too late. So we have all these different issues coming in. The movement from the physical to the digital, which affects our ability to reach out and touch the truth. We have the banking system deliberately undermining governments all over the world in order to maintain its, the status quo, which is governments run by debt and not taxes. We have educators failing to teach the truth, which is remarkable when you think about it, because if education is not there to teach the truth, uh, what is it there for, really? You have, because of all of this, a splintering across the world, which gives existing power structures, the ones that benefited from World War II, the ability to project, project their culture and their truths and their propaganda all over the world because governments have, been, have become an effective, more effective at propaganda than at providing services. COVID, this pandemic, has laid that fact bare. And you can see how the COVID pandemic is an attempt to harmonize not just immigration systems, but medical systems. You can see how that's happening now. You can see how there's an attempt. Is it going to happen? I don't know. I have no reason to be optimistic. The other thing I want you to think about is John Lennon's lyrics to the song, Imagine. One of my favorite songs, which now appears <clears throat> naive. He talks about no countries, in other words, no borders. He talks about no religion. And you sing that and you <clears throat> when you're younger, and it sounds fantastic because it sounds like we're finally going to achieve some kind of truth or some kind of principle that allows us to come together as a people, regardless of language, ethnicity, race, or religion, or accident of birth. And then you realize, wait a second, if we can't get on the same page regarding a common understanding of history, just in one country that has the resources to do it, that song, Imagine, will never become a reality. And so I call myself an accidental historian because I never wanted to study history. I just had to go, go into it in order to figure out the world around me. And that reminds me of another scene in Goodwill Hunting where the Robin Williams character tells Will to get out there in the world and explore it. Look at the Sistine Chapel. You can tell me everything you want about it, but it's not equivalent in any way to actually being there and smelling the premises. And by seeing it with your own eyes. And that, in a sense, has been my life so far. Is that I got the book knowledge, then I traveled the world, and I put together an understanding of history that was only possible because I'm now living in a gap period where the institutions have failed to build bridges, leaving, it, leaving that work to individuals 
that for the most part have been outside the system. That's always been the case, right? Malcolm X was outside the system. It's always been the case. But it's never threatened the world order. It's never threatened progress because remember, most of the world is undeveloped today. Imagine what it was like in 1991. And you can just think about this easily, right? Why, why did the Soviet Union sincerely believe that capitalism was decadent? Well, if you just go to these countries in Eastern, in, in Eastern Europe, or you go to the former Soviet territories, and you look at what the Soviets built, the difficulty in history is trying to imagine what was not, what's not there. Well, you go into these former Soviet republics, and you look at these train systems that still work, and you look at them now, if you haven't traveled, you look at them and say, boy, these are really old train systems. How terrible. Very utilitarian structures for housing. How gauche. Then you realize on a second visit, when you get older, wait a second, there was nothing there but farmland. People were homeless. They didn't have shelter in the cold. And maybe they weren't homeless, but they certainly couldn't afford a space with heating, with public transport that allowed the country to come together. And you start to realize that everyone is talking about development. And the only question is how to get there. Is it going to be through primarily debt? Is it going to be with a level of social understanding that binds us together? Or is it going to be completely fragmented? As it, as it has been in the United States internally. And the reason that's happened, because quite frankly, again, it's so much easier to build in other countries uh, than it is in the United States. And that's one of the reasons why if you're a restaurant, what is considered, considered fast food here, and in other words, food of a low quality, casual dining, is actually fine dining overseas with the same chain, with the same brand. And again, that's because of the power post-World War II of the American currency, of the European currency, which then allows that stability to create a foundation for products and services. But products and services don't have ideology connected to them for the most part. They try, it's part of their branding now, but they don't really have anything. That's what the socialists were complaining about. They were saying that you can have this world of development, of progress, but, Corporations stand for one thing only, and that's to make that is to make money. Well, not really, because you know, <laughs> if you're Coca-Cola, you have to preserve a water supply. You know, you know that the water supply, if it runs out, will bankrupt your business. So you have an, an interest in maintaining the water supply. Uh, that applies to anything food-related or farming, but maybe not so much with technology. So we, the human race have been attacked on all sides in a way that's almost unfair. Everything we see is, is in a sense fake because we can't touch or see what happened before it. If we're able to do so, we can see some progress, just progress that's fragmented and disjointed and that doesn't include with it principles that don't make a mockery of John Lennon's song, Imagine. What's very strange is realizing that in the midst of chaos in the 1960s, the people were able to believe that level of idealism. Give peace a chance, imagine. People were able to believe it because they believed that they were attaining or getting closer to a list of principles that would bind together the human race across borders. And that's with John Lennon, of course, he was uh, married to someone of a different race, um, obviously in love with her. That wasn't as common now, it wasn't common back then. So John Lennon lived, he lived the song there's a sense 
when you look at Robin Williams' advice to Goodwill, to hunt, to Will and Goodwill Hunting, there's a sense that more of us need to be following that advice. And because we haven't, we've delegated the task of attaining principles to self-interested parties like the banks. At the same time, the governments are failing to do anything other than preserve the status quo for their constituents. That's happening because of the fragmented system of American politics where the system is designed so that local communities have the ability to reject national impositions. But what's, so what's happened is when the country doesn't move forward together, what's happened is the politicians are rewarded for simply maintaining the status quo for their constituents when you include gerrymandering in that equation. So there's no benefit to progress in the political system, particularly where, when debt and banking is involved. So we go back once again to individuals. We go back to this idea that the smaller the country, the easier it's been to manage social cohesion, but only because we failed to live up to John Lennon's life and words. We failed to create a system of principles, despite having, at this point, 60 years to get, to get there. And it's been harder than, than expected because during that 60 years, the idea of progress has been built on a foundation of propaganda. In other words, on an unstable foundation. And we're just now realizing that. The effects of all of that over the last 60 years since the loss of Vietnam or the American war of aggression in Vietnam, we're just now seeing the effects. And that gives formerly colonized countries, whether Singapore or China, an advantage. Western civilization should be far more concerned about its future. It should be far more concerned about a future where it has the best houses and the fastest cars, but it's, it's no closer to developing principles that we can all agree on. If not the politicians, if not the teachers, then who else will rise up to the challenge in a way that reaches the mainstream, the majority of voters? You can see why democracy is embattled once you put all these pieces together. You can see why countries like China and Singapore, which have quasi-authoritarian, quote-unquote, anti-democratic systems, have been wildly more successful in maintaining social cohesion. The response to that has been, has, has been by the West to castigate these countries and their systems as oppressive, <laughs> when in fact, again, it may, be, may have been oppressive in some cities, in some cases, but certainly not as a whole. Otherwise, China wouldn't have had the ability to create the, the world's largest, or the largest middle class in world history over the last 25 so years. If you seek to differentiate your principles and your ideological systems, particularly the political systems that you live under, if you seek to differentiate themselves in a way that's superior by castigating a competitor system that is actually doing better, In a country that was built on the military industrial complex, a habit that never broke, you can see how that was going to cause some problems for democracy. You can see how people within that country are going to become disillusioned. You can see how eventually things fall apart. Even though you're gonna have the nicest houses, the fastest cars, but the number of people attaining those will get smaller and smaller and will eventually create an elite that is disconnected from the rest of society. So the idea has always been that you want nice things, but you also want the ability to get those nice things to as many people as possible in a way that prioritizes merit and the truth.
if you can't do it that, if you can't do that while claiming that you're doing that, you're going to have problems. That's where we are now. And that's where, that's why I, as a proponent of the individual and of, of, of individual freedom, am back into a corner where I have to claim or at least admit that a quasi-authoritarian system of government is now preferable to the American democratic system. Not because the principles are wrong, but because the implementation has failed. And that's the uncomfortable situation that I find myself in. So if you are, if you are in a similar situation, my advice is watch old movies. One of the benefits of having optimism is that you get to make great art. And I've always preferred older movies to modern ones. But once in a while, you get something that's remarkable. And of course, one of those movies is Goodwill Hunting. So I suggest if you're having similar difficulties to watch that movie and take Robin Williams' advice.